Okay. Um, so thank you, you guys, for coming. Um, this is, won't be the most interesting session of the conference. I'm glad it's a small group. Uh, we're going to do kind of a whirlwind tour. So this will be a little bit, uh, my talks tend to be very drinking from the fire hose oriented. Uh, so we're going to go through a pretty decent set of material pretty quickly because we've only got 45 minutes. Um, but stop me along the way if you have questions or ask me questions at the end or catch me you know, some other time during the conference if you have questions. Um, that's the really boring abstract about this talk. Uh, just some notes about me and about Unicon. Um, we're an IT consulting firm focused on open source, primarily in higher education. We work with a laundry list of uh, different open source projects in a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different places. Uh, and most importantly, I'm not a lawyer, so give me a break. Um, this is not legal advice. There you go, so now I'm off the hook. Now I can say anything I want to. I'm free and clear. All right, so a quick background on what we mean when we say open source before we dive into open source licensing. And most of you know this. It's my favorite um, open source picture. Uh, so what is open source software? This is a good just straight up definition of it. Software for which the original source code is made freely available. It may be modified and redistributed by anyone for any purpose. Uh, I think that does a nice job of capturing most of it. Um, you will hear other terms out in the market that really largely mean the same thing. So sometimes you'll hear the term free software. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a second. Open source software, or you'll see free slash open source software, or better yet, free Libre open source software. Um, and you'll see those abbreviations, OSFOS and FLOS, um, all around different places. So we get worried about the word free. Sometimes in this community we don't... You know, when we say free, what we really mean is it's free as in freedom or as in liberties. Um, you know, so the joke is always we say think free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. Um, although there's free beer tonight, or no, there's free beer last night, and there's free beer again uh, tomorrow night, so that's good. Um, I always like to joke it's more like free like a free puppy, right? You get to have it for free, but there's some care and feeding <laughs> that's required. So there are costs, you know. Um, Okay, so that's open source. So now, what do we mean by licensing when we talk about open source? And there's really a number of different pieces of it. So the, the licensing piece is kind of the most obvious that a lot of people see. And we talk about this as outbound licensing in the, in the foundation and a few other places. But it's kind of the most public part of open source and open source licensing. It's good to know about the two major organizations um, around open source licensing. The, the older, original one is the Free Software Foundation, or the FSF. And that really grew out of the GNU community, came before we even started using the term open source. They don't even like the term open source. They're the ones that want you to call that free software. Um, they're the promoters of the GPL, the GPL license. And so they approve various licenses as being free software licenses which basically means are they compatible with the GPL? We'll talk about compatibility a little bit more too. A little bit newer organization is the Open Source Initiative. And in fact, the Open Source Initiative is here. Pat Masson, who's their newly hired executive director, who actually comes out of our uh, community, which is very exciting, um, uh, is here representing the OSI. And they've been around for uh, a while now, I think 15 years. Um, and they're the ones that grew out of the coining of the term open source, and when they approve a license, you're allowed to call it an open source license. And that's when you're, you can use the logo and that kind of thing. Um, there were some disagreements with the FSF, really, over a long history. In fact, Pat's been trying to help heal some of those, uh, those rifts, which is good. Um, I've always characterized the OSI as being a little bit more pragmatic. Right? It was the Free Software Foundation guys were kind of talking about. Each of those two groups has their own <coughs> definition of what it means to be free or open source. I actually like the FSF's definition a little better because it's simple. Um, and of course, they're C programmers, so they start labeling things with zero instead of with one. Um, and so it's important to understand it's not just a matter of I have provided the source code <coughs> publicly. There's plenty of licenses that do that that are not free software and not open source software because they don't give you these other rights. So it's important that we have all these freedoms, that we're allowed to run it, we're allowed to study it, that we're allowed to change it and, and redistribute it and make improvements. If you're not allowed to do all of those things, it's not free software or it's not open source. 
this is actually, this isn't the OSI's definition, it's even longer, but they have 10 points, and I've boiled them down, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, but the OSI's definition is a little longer in terms of distribution and source code and what you're allowed to do with derived works, and you're not allowed to just, you're not allowed to say, well, you can reuse the code, but only in this area, right? You're not allowed to limit the areas, um, things like that. Uh, but so they've got a pretty comprehensive definition of what they mean by open source. Okay, we need to talk about copyright for a second because it's really the foundation on which all open source licensing is built. So it used to be that before the idea of free software and open source came along that the licensing of software was very kind of binary. It was either closed and proprietary and kind of all rights reserved or been around long enough, you remember uh, public domain software, right? People would put stuff out there and then say, well, this is public domain. I'm not sure legally that actually worked right, but um, it was kind of this no rights reserved idea. The idea of open source is, well, there are some rights that are reserved. We're giving you some rights to the software. We're not giving you complete uh, opportunity to do absolutely anything, right? We are retaining the copyright, for example. So the license will have rules that you have to follow. Now those rules have to comply with that open source definition, um, but there are still rules in all of these licenses. Um, so it is important to remember that when open source is licensed, when someone, when you license software as open source, that doesn't mean you're giving up your copyright. Someone still always owns the copyright to software until copyright expires, right? which doesn't happen for a ridiculous amount of time these days. Usually you have to be dead for a significant amount of time before your copyrights expire. So someone owns those copyrights. You know, by default, it's the creator, whoever created things, owns that copyright unless they sell it or transfer it, or dedicate it, or do something to force that copyright to go somewhere. So copyright holders aren't giving up any of their own rights to their own work. They're still allowed to do whatever they want to do with their own work. They still hold their copyrights. They can turn around and license that IP under, under a non-open source license if they want to. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, everyone else, though, who receives the software in some way has to follow the rules of the license that the copyright holder is elected to provide them. That might be multiple different licenses, or there might be just one. Okay. Now we get to jump to the even weirder concept. So copyright's this real legal thing. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's in the Constitution, right? But then there's copyleft, which is a slightly invented thing that we use um, as jargon in open source licensing to talk about a specific aspect of open source licensing, which is the idea of requiring reciprocity. What it, what, it, what it says essentially is that if I provide open source software out and you consume it under that open source license and now you make changes or improvements and you redistribute those changes or improvements, the principle of copyleft says you should have to give those changes back under the same terms that I provided the original software, right? Reciprocity, if I give it to you, you improve upon it, you must give it back to me. You must give it back to me under the same terms. You can't add it or make, it up, make up new rules when you do it. That's the idea of copyleft. Okay. Um, sometimes, pejoratively, you'll hear this referred to as viral licensing. And that's there's some validity to referring to it as viral. Um, because if the originating license is copyleft, it means that all subsequent works will also have to be copyleft. Right? There's basically a requirement that says this form of licensing has to stay in place all the way down the chain. Whereas if you start with a license that has no copyleft requirements, it doesn't ever attach itself to the other IP that you might be mixing in. Okay? So that's the idea of copyleft. Now, when we talk about copyleft or reciprocity, there's some key dimensions to it, which are when does it trigger, right? What do I have to do to trigger the requirements for reciprocity? So for example, if I'm consuming um, copyleft licensed code, but I only use it for my own private individual purposes, 
it probably never triggers. I'm never required to give back my code. Uh, usually something has to happen like redistribution. If I make it publicly available, if I run it onto a CD and ship it to people, if I embed it in a piece of hardware, right? Those are all redistribution. Um, where some licenses now go as far as talking about hosting. If you make it available via the via a network, right, that's considered a form of distribution and the copyleft provisions would trigger at that point. Then the other key concern around copyleft is how far does it reach, right? So there's the copyleft provisions on the, on the original source code, but if I'm kind of adding things next to it, does, does it apply to that code or not? Right, so a weak version of copyleft would mean it probably doesn't apply to things that kind of travel alongside the code. The stronger the copyleft aspect of the license is, the more likely it is that if you're putting something alongside copyleft code that your stuff also has to be licensed under that same uh, license. We'll talk some more about, us, about specific licenses in that space. We'll talk about it now. So this is the granddaddy of open source licenses, right? We're going to talk about a few specific licenses just to, to get a sense for these. Um, the GPL is the oldest open source license, you know, kind of true open source license, kind of the original um, open source license. It's a strong copyleft license. Okay? So um, it defines a derivative work as anything that runs in the same scope of the process, including dynamic language. So if you're communicating over a network between two pieces of software, the GPL doesn't trigger for you. But if it's dynamically linked and talks to something in memory, that counts. Okay. So in the Microsoft world, if it's a DLL file and you're using it at runtime, that counts. In Java, if it's a jar file that you're pulling in at runtime, it counts. Okay. So in Java, if you use somebody's open source GPL license code, but the only thing you ever pull in is their jar file, Everything you do downstream of that has to be GPL licensed as well because you're pulling in a piece of GPL licensed software. And here's this reciprocity, and this is why pejoratively sometimes it's referred to as viral. Right? It creates requirements on your dependent code if you're redistributing all of that together. Now, if what you distribute doesn't include that binary, right? if you say, well, the software relies on that jar, but you can go get it yourself and download it and install it, now you never distributed the job, so you're okay. Right? It's only if you're redistributing it that those kinds of things start to trigger. Um, there are actually three different versions of the GPL. There's the normal GPL, and then there's really two different variants of it that either reduce or extend that scope of the copyleft. So the lesser GPL, or the LGPL, sometimes it used to be called the library GPL, but they changed that to mean lesser. Um, is actually a weaker set of copyleft provisions. And it basically says if you want to redistribute an unmodified binary of a library, that's okay. And it doesn't attach itself to your own code and require all the GPL provisions. But if you do it with source code, then you absolutely do. Okay. So if you make changes to their own source code, you have to give that stuff back. Or if you add something that compiles into that jar, you have to give that back. But if it's just, well, I just want to use that jar, that's fine. You can redistribute LGPL, and it doesn't affect the licensing of your larger one. GPL it does if you redistribute it. Then the other alternate version you'll hear about is the AGPL, or the, it stands for the Afero GPL, which I don't even remember the origins of the word Afero. I think it's the group that helped come up with it. And it's actually a stronger version of copyleft that includes network usage, essentially. So if you use the code, I sometimes refer to this as the anti-Google license, right? Google uses an obscene amount of open source software, and they never have to give any of it back, although they're pretty good about giving stuff back. But they technically never have to, because they never distribute code, right? They just run everything themselves. It's all in the cloud, right? So Google doesn't use anything. They don't use any AGPL code. In fact, Google code never even allowed you to choose the AGPL as your own license. They don't like it. <laughs> So, uh, so that's the idea of AGPL, is if you, if you use it in the cloud, if you will, right, you post a website, then this triggers. So an interesting example in our own community is, that we all hear about a lot in the LMS space, is Canvas, right? People like to talk about Canvas is open source. First of all, it's not quite true, go do your homework. Um, but the bits of it that are open source are AGPL, 
So if you if you as a university make a change to the code and you use it, you're required to give that back to instruction because it's HTML licensed. You're running it on a website. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there's actually two major versions of the GPL in common use today. There's GPL v2, which has been around since, I think, 1991. Uh, and then there's the GPL v3, uh, which, is, which got finalized, I don't know how long ago now, three, four years ago? Some projects will say that they are licensed using GPL version 2 or later, in which case you can consume it under either one. Um, some projects will say they are only GPL v2, in which case you can only consume it. New projects are mostly using GPLv3. Um, I'll tell one other interesting story about GPLv2 in a second. So one thing to keep in mind in open source licensing, why do we spend a lot of time talking about the GPL, especially in Perio where we don't use GPL, is it's really the most important license out there, if only because so much of the so many of the projects out there use it. Uh, at one point, the estimate was 70% of open source projects are GPL or LGPL licensed. Um, we inevitably, in any open source project, run into, I want to use this thing as part of my project, and it is either GPL or LGPL licensed, can I do that? And the answer to that is not a short, immediate, obvious answer. Um, if it's GPL, the answer is probably no, you can't use it. <laughs> uh, if it's LGPL, it's it's a very, very, very cautious yes, and with some very specific considerations involved. Um, so one of the things we talk about a lot is whether licenses are GPL compatible. So other various licenses, it's key to know whether they're GPL compatible, meaning can I take software under GPL and take software under some other license, put them together in one larger distributed work, First of all, what license does that have to be under if I do that? The answer is it has to be under one of the GPL licenses, because that's what the GPL licenses say. But it also has to be true that there isn't something in the other license that contradicts something that's in the GPL license, because if that's true, they are not considered compatible. Um, so if you're mixing GPL with non-GPL, you have to kind of do this audit of you know, what's going on there. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the other licenses in a second and what their compatibility is. So the Apache license is actually the most important one for Perio, for this audience. Um, it's a comprehensive open source license. It covers a lot of the same areas as the GPL, um, but it's not copyleft at all. There's zero copyleft in the Apache license. It's what we call a, um, uh, a permissive license. So it's completely permissive. You can do, as a downstream consumer of Apache software, you can essentially do whatever you want to do. If you want to take a commercial, make it into a commercial product and turn around and sell it, that's fine. Right? Now folks who are big fans of GPL will pull back at that thought of, you know, that's actually where GPL came out of was Richard Stallman's software ending up in a proprietary product and him freaking out about it. And um, understandably, uh, Apache license would still allow that. Right? Downstream uh, commercial consumption of software is valid. So there's always interesting discussions to be had of which is which is good, which is bad. I'm not going to get into that in this talk, but catch me over here and I'll tell you what I think. Um, the Apache license is compatible with GPL v3, but technically not compatible with GPL v2, although some of the folks in the FSF will tell you that it's fine. To combine those. Um, but that's been considered an issue. So that's something to keep in mind. GPLv3 is compatible and GPLv2 is not. It's just because there's some slightly contradictory, I think it's related to patent termination clauses that um, conflict with each other, and that's actually an issue with that. Apache license is the second most popular license in open source. Um, and it's it's primarily used by projects that want a really comprehensive license, but they don't have the the, the need to follow copy left. I'm going to mention two other licenses quickly just because they're they're common uh, and you may run into them. So one interesting one is the BSD license or sometimes we call it the new BSD license. There's actually a bunch of different variants of this, which is funny because it's only 220 words long. Um, so why there's a bunch of variances is this. It fits on like a cocktail napkin, right? I mean, it's a really short license. It's very, very basic. Um, it basically just says, uh, 
You can do, you use this to do whatever you want to, but you have to keep these copyrights in place. And there's a disclaimer that says, you know, it's not suitable for much of anything. Um, and you have to keep that disclaimer with it. You're not allowed to use the copyright holder's name to endorse anything. And that's about it. That's really all it says in 220 words. Um, the MIT license is very similar as well. And the nice thing about BSD is it's super short and simple and couldn't be more permissive if you wanted it to be. The problem is it doesn't even touch on the concept of patents. It doesn't even touch on the concepts of trademarks. So it's not very comprehensive from a legal standpoint. So lawyers are freaked out by it because it's so ridiculously short. Um, is that good or bad? Again, that, you know, uh, ask me over here. Um, one other one uh, that's worth knowing about is the Mozilla Public License. It's a, what they call a weak copyleft license. It's even weaker than the LGPL. So it's got some copyleft in it, um, but the copyleft only provide, applies to individual source code files. So if you take an MPL project and you change one of the files, you have to give back those changes. But if you add a file, it's totally fine. You don't have to give them that file if you don't want to. So it's a very weak copyleft, but a little bit in there. Um, it is incompatible with GPL. Again, there's some minor restrictions that, that conflict. Uh, and there's a few derivatives of it out there. The Cuddle license, which I don't think anybody but the Sun and Oracle use. Uh, and then the CPAL license, which was popular for a little while. Um, I don't know if anybody's using it heavily anymore. It's got this added attribution requirement that basically says, you can do whatever you want to with this open source software, except this big, nasty advertisement I put in the middle of it, you're not allowed to take that out. So uh, gradually refer to that as batchware, right? It'll usually have some kind of big logo in it um, from the people who made it that you're not allowed to take out. So a lot of kind of hybrid commercial open source groups like it because they you know, get to be in your face about whose software it is and it discourages other people forking. Okay, so that's kind of a quick tour. Oops. Google calendars reminded me that I have a meeting that I'm not going to today. Okay. Uh, so that's all outbound licensing, right? That's all talking about people who consume a project. What are the terms under which they can consume? It's all that outbound licensing. So that when we talk about open source, 99% of the thought going into it is on that outbound licensing part. If only that were the end of it, <laughs> right? It's complicated enough, but even that's not the end of it. It gets even more complicated when we have to start thinking about inbound licensing. Where this comes into play is when um, the, the creators of open source software aren't all one legal entity, right? If open source software is created by a single person or created by a single organization and its employees, you don't really ever have to worry about the inbound contributions because the copyrights are all held by one legal entity, right? One copyright holder deciding to open source their software. You really only have to worry about outbound licensing. There is no inbound licensing. You already own it all. But if one legal entity doesn't own all the code, you need to think about inbound licensing. How does that work? So it's important to understand in any given project, who are the copyright owners? Who do we want the copyright owners to be? And if we're going to have multiple contributing people in organizations, then we're going to have, we might have, we might choose to have multiple copyright holders in that group. And you can't actually tell, looking at an open source project, you can't tell, looking at their open source license, how they handle any of this. Because none of that's covered. That's all out there. You've got to dig a little deeper to find out, how do they handle inbound licensing? Most projects don't handle it at all. We'll talk about that. Um, but it's a very separate choice, right? How you want to handle this is a very separate choice from how you're handling your outbound licensing. So there's three major ways that you can choose to handle this. And I'll start with the most extreme, and we'll get, well, there's kind of two extremes and a happy middle. So one extreme you can take is copyright assignment, where you can say, Right? I'm running this project, or there is this project, and anybody who contributes to it, that's fine. You have to sign over your copyrights. You have to give them to us. Right? It's, yes, it's your property, your intellectual property, but we want you to give us that intellectual property. Now it is no longer your intellectual property. Okay? So that's called copyright assignment. 
It allows one person in, or usually it's not a person, it's usually some kind of corporate entity. It allows that entity to maintain complete control over the IP. And so they require all their contributors to assign the copyrights over. Sometimes it's a joint assignment that says, well, we'll both own it, a joint ownership of that copyright. Where it might be a transfer where, the, where you get a really broad license back that says, well, we technically own it now, but you're allowed to use, we're going to give you permission to use your own creation for whatever you want to call it, even though you don't have it. It seems kind of extreme. Contributors kind of go, you want what? Uh, anyway, so that one's a little hard to um, It's what Sun always used to do. So I always say Sun, and then I cross it out and say Oracle. All of these practices came from Sun. Oracle like hates open source, so they don't. They wish they didn't have to do any of this, but kind of stuck with some of it from acquiring the sun. Uh, so they have uh, a copyright assignment that they would have people sign whenever they were going to contribute to one of their projects. Okay, the happy mini middle here is to do, instead of transferring the copyright, is to license the copyright into a central organization. But it's not the same as the outbound license. It's a different license. It's a broader license right? that's basically giving a central group the right to then redistribute and relicense, kind of sublicense, the IP that you've licensed to that particular group under whatever terms. It could include copy, that might, this might also include a patent license in addition to the copyright license. And it allows the project or the entity that's organizing the project to then redistribute the source code under its own outbound license without any issues. The nice thing is it gives them some, a little bit more flexibility. Right? So if at some point the outbound licensing needs to change, new things come up right, from a legal or a business or you know, whatever standpoint, uh, where we may want to make changes to licensing. And uh, it's good for some central, well, arguably, I would argue, it's good for some central group to have some latitude to adjust the outbound licensing terms as needed to keep them keep them happy. Uh, so this is a nice compromise. It's not so extreme. You know, the original copyright holder still owns their copyrights, but now there is a central group that has some flexibility in, in how the outbound licensing goes. Um, this is what's used by the Apache Software Foundation for all of their projects. It's also what we use, and we'll talk about that. The third option that's kind of at the opposite extreme from the, the actual copyright assignment is don't do anything other than use the outbound license as the inbound license. So, and this is actually how most projects operate, kind of almost unintentionally in a lot of cases. Uh, essentially, if you're making contributions to an open source project and you didn't sign any kind of contributor agreement or, or copyright assignment, then you're kind of Im implicitly contributing your work under the outbound license as, we, as if it were the inbound license. So it's simple. It's largely the default. This is what the Linux kernel project does, right? I mean, the single largest, this depends how you measure it, right? But, the, maybe the most prominent open source project in the world, this is how they do it. Now the problem with this is, I don't know whether this is a problem or not. The problem with this is that everyone's inbound contribution is under GPL v2. There are so many people who have contributed that way that no one can ever use, distribute, or do anything with Linux under any legal terms other than GPL v2 ever. At some point, GPLv2 becomes a problem in and of itself. That's a real problem for Linux. So we're going to have to think, you know, I don't know what's going to happen if something bad happens on that. So, uh, there's been an example of this kind of thing already. Mozilla used to do their licensing this way too, under the MPL. They used to take all their inbound licensing under the MPL and the outbound licensing. Problem with the MPL is one of the things we mentioned is that it's not compatible um, with the GPL. And they wanted to be able to distribute Mozilla stuff, Firefox, Thunderbird, on Linux distributions, right? Makes sense. Good default browser. It's in there now, right? They couldn't do this for years. I don't know if you remember Ice Weasel. Ice Weasel was the workaround for this problem. Wow, they couldn't put Firefox in the Linux distributions because it 
all the inbound contributions were under MPL. You couldn't take MPL and distribute it with GPL. So Mozilla said, well, what we want to do is adjust our licensing. We want to dual license everything. We want to license everything as both MPL and I think it was LGPL. And the problem was Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation didn't have the legal right to do that because the code is owned by the copyright holders. The only permission they had to use it was under the MPL. They're not allowed to turn around and say, and now it's LGPL. That's a violation of some of the terms of the MPL. So they spent, no joke, two years going back, tracking down 450 different contributors, some of whom had died, and that they had to get their estate to sign something that says, yes, it's OK if. Right? So that's my cautionary tale on get a contributor license agreement, <laughs> because you don't ever want this to happen to you. OK. Um, there are reusable contributor license agreements. So just like we primarily use existing open source outbound licenses, you can also use existing open source inbound licenses. Um, so if you want to use this kind of happy medium, the Apache contributor license agreements are the gold standard. That's what everybody uses. Um, if you're just, uh, if you want the contributors to assign the copyright to a central organization, there's actually a pretty good agreement from the Free Software Foundation in Europe, I don't know why it's in the European one, called the Fiduciary License Agreement, that's actually really well written. Um, and then if you want to do joint copyright, which is what the Sun now Oracle agreement does, those are all good reusable um, contributor agreements. Um, again, I highly recommend the Apache ones, and that's what we use in Aperio as well. And the one thing, and this is just kind of a, if you're running an open source project, please make sure you do all these things, right, in order to properly handle the licensing of your project. Make sure you clearly list the license of your project somewhere on your website. It's really annoying when I'm looking at an open source project, and I, it takes me 15 minutes to find out what it's licensed, because nobody's bothered to document it. So just say something, what, what your license is. In every binary and source distribution, right, so by distribution, right, something you're bundling up, right, a zip file, an executable, or whatever, right, if you're making a thing available for download, make sure there's a readme file in it that says what the license is. Um, make sure you've included a copy of that license. You can just download the file from somewhere, but include it in your distribution. Make sure you look at all the pieces of software you're using and include any notices that are required by those additional pieces of software. Make sure you put a comment header in every source code file that says what you're, you know, with some licensing information. Not necessarily copyright information, but at least licensing. Um, make sure those headers are maintained and audited. And then document what your inbound uh, licensing policies as well if you're trying to solicit additional contributors. And if you're using a contributor license agreement, make it available for download right away so other people can contribute. Okay, so that's all background <laughs> with, you know, what, 10 minutes to go? Uh, so let me talk about how we do things in a period. And hopefully that background will make this all go. So our outbound license. Our primary outbound license is the Apache license itself. We like using the Apache license because it's really broadly recognized, right? It's well understood, it's well respected, we understand the compatibility of it, right? all of those kinds of things. And historically, most of our communities have decided to not sweat the not the, the non-existence of copyleft, right? The, the lack of reciprocity requirements. As it turns out in the industry, for the most part, forcing copyleft in your licensing kind of closes you off from community contributions that you can get other parts. And the market tends to understand when people are just um, freeloading <laughs> off your software and they want to come to your stream. So it turns out the market is actually probably better at dealing with the whole copyleft thing than the licenses are. So there's that non-year uh, opinion. Um, we have an alternate license that we're totally fine with, which is the education community license, or the ECL, so you're the ECL for 
Um, ACL came specifically out of education. It came specifically out of projects like Sakai. And it's because there were some schools that were um, having trouble with how broad the patent license in the Apache license is. There's a section of the Apache license that basically says if you've contributed any, if any of this code implements something that is patented, then, the, then that patent comes along with it automatically give permission for you to use this implementation of this patent. Not to use some other implementation of the patent, not to create your own implementation of the patent, to use that implementation. And that's important because otherwise it would be possible for someone to say contribute a copyright of some code that implements something that they have patented and for them to then come back later and go to everybody, ha ha, you implemented something I have a patent on, now you must license the patent for me. Money. I didn't give you permission to use my patent. I just gave you permission to use my copyrighted implementation of that patent. Right? So the Apache license says if you contribute code that implements your patent, you've contributed your patent to. Now some of the schools were concerned that their own patent portfolio is so broad that they may not, they may have one person in the institution who writes an implementation of code of somebody's patent way over here that this person really didn't have any right or permission to contribute. And so they wanted to narrow the scope of that patent contribution to say only the patent holder, the actual person whose name is on the patent, is the one who can then contribute that. Now the onus is on the school to not contribute code that implements a patent that somebody else has implemented. It's not the downstream consumer's responsibility to do that. It's the contributor's responsibility. But ECL basically narrows the scope so you can see the it's exactly the Apache language, but they've added this sentence to it, okay? just to narrow that scope. So, John, yes. I think there was one school back. One system, let's say yeah. that. One system, yes. maybe located somewhere on the West Coast. Yeah. And I, I want you to explain that to me again. I will. Please. I will Thank gladly you. explain that to you again. <laughs> I, wasn't there. I wasn't in the smoke filled yeah. rooms where this came, came together, so my understanding of it is, is second hand at best. Um, but yeah, I can try and explain that again. Okay. Um, for all intents and purposes, they are the same license. Right? There's just a small change that made some people a little bit more comfortable. It's a totally OSI approved open source license. Right? It's a completely viable license. The only thing I don't like about it, people don't know what it is. Right? It's, it's, it's an obscure license. It was created for a specific purpose. And so when you say, oh, it's an ECL license, they go, I don't know what that is. But if you tell somebody it's a patch license, they go, I know what that is. So that's the only reason that we've pushed. Please do Apache if you can, but if for some reason your community says no to that, you can do ECL, and that's totally fine. Aperio is open to doing other outbound licensing, but we don't want to. Right? We'd like to stay consistent with Apache and with ECL. Because it's all compatible with itself at that point. Um, and it's kind of what we're known for. It's what our ethos is at this point. However, we don't want to be dogmatic. If there's a project or a community that for some reason must use a particular license, already has a history of using a different license, um, or some other reason, we want to leave ourselves open to considering something else. So it's possible, but during the incubation process, that's going to have to go to the board of directors um, and be reviewed. And OK, so that's outbound license. Inbound license. We use a set of, of CLAs. These are the terms that you'll hear. We'll talk about an ICLA, a CCLA, and an SGLA. So there's three different agreements that we have. These are standard boilerplate templates that are on the website, PDF forms. You can put your name in, print out, sign them. There's a bunch of ICLAs sitting at the registration desk if you want to go fill one out in order to make sure you've got one on file. Um, the ICLA is an individual one. Okay, So everyone who is a contributor individually must sign one of those. doesn't matter whether you're contributing on your own time and your own dollar or if you work for a company or an institution or school and you're doing it for them. Everyone who contributes must sign an ICLA regardless of which one of those is true. If your contributions are being done on behalf of your employer, you need your employer to also complete the CCLA. It says, I authorize my employees to be going off and doing this. So some officer of, of that institution has to complete that, that CCLA. That can be a little harder than lawyers do. 
Um, those are ongoing. Those are kind of perpetual agreements that say, going forward, anything I contribute, here are the terms I've contributed about. There's a third one, this SGLA, which is an, it, it's a one-time event. So that's not an ongoing contribution. It's a very specific, I am contributing the following, and you enumerate what it is, and it happens at that one point in time, but it doesn't apply to anything else going forward. So that's why the SGLA exists. Um, the SGLA is something we tend to use if a major project kind of comes over in bulk um, from, from some location. All of those are word for word the same as the Apache CLAs, except for the identification of which foundation you are contributing to. Okay. All right, I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to go quick. But um, other important things to think about from a policy standpoint third party content. In lots and lots of our distributions, we're including not just our own original works that are part of that project, we're including third party stuff, right? Frameworks and libraries and whatever that we depend on. If we do that and it's included in a distribution, it doesn't matter if it's a source code distribution or a binary distribution, we need to identify those and we need to make sure that we know what their licensing is and that we follow the rules of that license. Um, and we want to make sure we completely document that inside every project in a notices file. Okay. Third party content will consume a lot of it via open source, right? So a lot of it will be other open source projects that we want to use. So we have some guidelines on different open source licenses out there and whether they're a good idea or not, whether they're good to go or not. So there's three categories. These are also borrowed from the Apache family. With category A, which is the you're fine, right? If what you're consuming is licensed under Apache, BSD, MIT, Creative Commons, you're good to go. Uh, those are totally compatible with Apache and we're fine. There are some licenses that are probably okay, but you need to proceed with some caution. There's some restrictions you need to think about. So category B, which is the proceed with caution category, basically says you're fine if you use this in an unmodified form, but if you make changes to it, you're going to have to comply with their licensing. So make sure you're, you're in the clear. An example there is, is MPL license. Category X, or the you have a problem category, right, is essentially stuff where we've got some serious concerns, we can't really use it. Um, and the examples here are all the GPL licenses. Now, two important notes about this, though, that move things out of category X. One is there are some projects that have what we call a FOSS exception or a FLOSS exception that basically say, well, we're GPL, unless what you're doing is some other open source license, and they'll usually list them. And they'll say, if that's true, then you're fine using our stuff as long as your stuff stays in your own license. So in that case, you can think about using it as yellow, but you got to remember that you're creating a downstream issue too for other consumers. So it's not, you don't get to go to category A for that, <laughs> but you at least get to go to category B. The other thing is that it's LGPL, it's on category X because we want to make sure it never ever ends up in our source code, right? If you have LGPL licensed source code that makes it into our source code, we have a problem, right? It will all, it will trigger all the nastiness, we you consider it nasty. Uh, of those copyleft provisions. If you're only distributing the binary, you're okay. So technically, the binaries under LGPL are category B, and the source code under LGPL is category B. Ask me more about that later if that's confusing. Okay, a couple other quick things to think about. You might be including stuff in a distribution that isn't code, right? It might be media or data or documentation. Sometimes source code licensing is awkward for that in terms of its terminology. The Apache license you can use for documentation is totally fine. Um, but you might need to think about, well, there's content in here that's just not appropriate to license it this way, and that you want the outbound licensing of it to be something like Creative Commons, which is certainly conceptually very akin to the Apache license, but is, is obviously a very different language. We haven't established firm policy in this area for Perio yet. We're still going to work on this, but keep this in mind. If you're looking at, we've got media we want to license differently. It's something. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, GNU has a, a free uh, documentation license, the FDL that, that is used. It has all the copyleft in it again, so you know we're not going to use the FDL, I think. Um, 
But yes, you're right, there are. And there are some very custom licenses for, there's like an open database license as well where you're licensing a data set, um, which is pretty cool that, that I think is worth looking. Uh, one, uh, I think, last thing to mention is trademarks and service marks. Right, This is an important part of intellectual property that often gets really short shrift in open source. The foundation is the owner of all of the marks of the foundation itself, as well as all its constituent projects. Okay? So as we bring in projects, we want to make sure that we collect up those marks so that we can protect them, Right, so that people don't go around starting to use our logos and our project names in ways that we as the communities you know, aren't comfortable with. Um, we have some very, very general policy in this area. We have a number of our uh, trademarks and service marks registered, but we as a foundation still have a lot of work to do in this area too, both in terms of policy as well as making sure we get everything registered. Okay. Uh, and then this is the last thing, is just to make sure every project knows, right? These are your responsibilities as a project. Make sure all your contributors have completed license agreements. Make sure your license is properly included with your project, that your notices are properly maintained, that your source code files have that proper header, that you've handled all your third-party content appropriately, and then that you've taken care of your trademarks and service marks. So you've identified them, you've researched them, you've registered them, you've transferred them, whatever we need to do to take care of those service marks. And if only I had time left for questions, I'd be happy to take some as a group. But since I know we're running up against um, time to go over to the, uh, uh, so we have next, there's a, there's a group session next. Uh, oh, it's the Networking Cafe is next, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so we'll make sure everybody has time. For, but I guess we've got 15 minutes before that starts, so we've got five minutes we can take questions. Does anybody have anything specifically you want to ask? And I'm happy to talk one on one during networking or whatever. Yeah. Within universities that do this on a regular basis, how, how do they actually manage the paperwork for their teams? Do they file it with the project in their source code, or do they do you see offline storage with uh, legal, or what, what do they usually do with that source code? That's a great question. So just for for the recording, the, the question was uh, how do institutions handle the paperwork? I assume primarily around the inbound licensing, right? Projects. Um, so of course, I don't know how the institutions handle, you know, the kind of management and storage of the paperwork on their end. That's kind of up to them. But, but I can tell you how it works, kind of at the interface with the foundation and then what the foundation does. Um, we track on all of the projects that have emerged from incubation. We make sure that every single uh, committer, right, anyone who has commit rights has an ICLA on file. Okay. So we have a registered list of every single person that we have an ICLA on file for. Um, we have scanned copies of, the, you know, of everybody's document. They're all stored online in a place where people from the foundation can get at those anytime we need. There's contact information in those, and we harvest that into a, into a database where we can go get people's email addresses and phone numbers and stuff. Um, so that's for committers. If anyone makes a significant contribution who's not a committer yet, the only way it gets into the code base is some committer applies it. Right? So one of the rules for the committers is, of course, you're allowed to commit your own stuff. If you're committing somebody else's stuff, you have to make sure that person has a CLA on file as well. So if, they're, if, it's, a, if it's a pull request that they've submitted in GitHub or whatever the case may be. Um, we need to make sure they have an ICLA on file as well. So that's a responsibility of the committers on all the projects. In the ICLA, now we as the foundation never really know whether an individual is making a contribution on their own behalf or on their employer's behalf. We usually have some idea, but there's really no way for us to know at a legal level, is this your intellectual property or is this your employer's property? In the ICLA, it says it is your responsibility to know that you have permission to give this contribution to the foundation. So if, you, if, if you're doing that on your own, that's fine. If you're doing it on behalf of your employer, it's on you as the individual to make sure that your institution has a CCLA on file. As we in the foundation work with a given institution, of course, we immediately start talking about you need to get this CCLA on file. And most of the time, we know who's working with who and why and where. Um, so we can kind of toe the line on the CCLA part as well. 
the CCLA, um, our responsibility is to make sure that the, the signatory to that is someone who's in a position as an officer of the corporation, right? Someone who's legally allowed to sign you know, contracts and so forth. So we've had a few cases where someone tried to submit a CCLA and, you know, it's a faculty member. We say, you know, we really appreciate that you've submitted this and signed this, but we're pretty sure you're not allowed to commit your university to this. You know, we need this escalated to your in-house counsel or to your provost or to your, you know, whoever is the appropriate person. And it's hard that we can't really tell an institution who that is. Um, that, that one sometimes takes a while, right? Like sometimes it'll, it'll take a few weeks of review. Sometimes I need to get on a call and just kind of help talk somebody through it. Sometimes we need to get an actual lawyer involved so they can talk to a real lawyer and um, you know, take, take care of those kinds of issues. Um, but one way or another, we end up you know, getting those signed. And, then we're, you know, and so the same thing, we keep all those on file the same way. We have a database of all the um, institutions that we have those on file from all the middle. Does that answer the question? I mean, it answers it from, from your perspective. I was just curious yeah. about if you had any knowledge about what institutions are Yeah, it, it, it just varies, you know, by what their their own um, policies and procedures are around those kinds of things. Um, you know, we certainly make sure that at the interface, you know, everybody's got the paperwork in place that they should. We just try to help the institutions get through it however they need to. So sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a year. Get those CCLAs done. Any other questions? Okay, thanks everybody.